So welcome everybody and welcome also to those who are following us online and I'm going to say right at the start while I remember it that if you want to send in any questions uh, for the discussion uh, please se email them to APGRD and um, they will then be sifted for you. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Alex Piqueux from Nanterre, from the University of Nanterre in Paris. Um, I first met her because I was one of the six examiners of her doctorate and all six of us had to make a little speech and Alexa had to reply to all six of us. Um, I knew what the result was going to be partly because there was a big ice bucket full of bottles of champagne uh, and partly because it was one of the, I mean in my 50 years of examining doctorates, I'm not exaggerating when I say it was one of the very best doctorates I, I ever read. Um, uh, it was a doctorate's worth entirely on the, what do you might call the literary side, entirely on, on the uh, dramatists, on Aristophanes and, and all amazing control of all the fragments of old and middle comedy. Uh, that would have got a doctorate in itself and the, uh, also amazing on the uh, iconographic and material culture side, that too would have got a doctorate. So um, I encouraged, uh, I think I personally encouraged Alexa to, to publish it in our Ancient Culture and Representation series with OUP and after much uh, revising and shortening and getting it translated into extremely good English and illustrating it with magnificent illustrations, many of which are very difficult to get hold of anywhere else. Uh, it came out uh, in 2022, um, and uh, the, the, it's more or less the same title, The Comic Body in Ancient Greek Theatre and Art. In fact, that is it, The, ancient, <laughs> the Comic Body in Ancient Greek Theatre and Art, 440 to 320. Um, and it's so good to be able to get Alexa to come here and give you some taste of the kind of things she's doing. She now has a five-year research grant in which to pursue this further, build up contacts, and I'm absolutely delighted that the APGRD here in Oxford is one of her contacts. So, Alexa Picot. Thank you very much for this very generous uh, introduction. And thank you very much also, of course, uh, to you, Oliver, and to Fiona for inviting me today in the seminar of AGPRD. I'm very honored and grateful to have this opportunity to present a few aspects of my research on Greek comedy and South Italian verse painting. I hope that my English will not make this talk and the discussions that will follow too strenuous for you, and sorry in advance for this. So, using both textual and iconographic sources, my book considers the representation of the body during the Greek classical era in old and middle comedy, how it was staged, perceived, and imagined. I've explored how the various components of the costumes and the body language contribute to the character's visual identity in relation with speech. I've analyzed the cultural, social, aesthetic, and theatrical conventions by which spectators decipher the body. This study has led to shed light on how comic poets make use of the scenic or imaginary representations of the bodies of those who are targets of political, social, or intellectual satire. To better understand the nature of the laughter aroused by comedy and the specific modalities of comic mimesis, I've also considered the generic features of the comic body, characterized as it is by a specific ugliness and a constant motion. And this is on these two features that I will focus in this talk, also trying to show how to combine the evidence from comic texts and comedy-related images. Indeed, it's also a major stake of this study on the comic body to refine knowledge of the relationship between old and middle comedy and South Italian comic vases, depending on the regional contexts in which these vases were produced and used. Some 20 Attic vases, dating from around 430 to 360, can be considered in relation to comedy. However, they are li of limited interest to the study of dramatic representations, either because the painting is very damaged or because they show comic performances in an indirect or insufficiently realistic way. 
Around 250 vases from South Italian Sicily, dated from the three first quarters of the 4th century, show at least one actor on stage or in a Dionysiac context with a comic costume, such as can be seen in Attic iconography, in particular on this terracotta figurine. You can see the, yes, my little uh, arrow. So, uh, the same uh, costume as on uh, this uh, Attic terracotta figurines. The comic costume includes a mask with deformed features, padding around the belly, the buttocks, and the chest, an artificial phallus for male roles, jerkins with close fitting sleeves, and leggings. Compared with these figurines, vase paintings have undeniable advantages when it comes to studying the body. The figurines are precious testimony to the features and popularity of stock characters. However, it's sometimes difficult to date them precisely. Moreover, for technical reasons, gestures are often less well reproduced in figurines than in painting scenes. On vast paintings, it's possible to observe the way in which the body takes its place in dramatic space, the poses and gestures of actors. At the end of the 1940s, Thomas Bertram Lonsdale Webster already connected middle comedy to vases from South Italy. At this time, these vases were known as Fliax vases. In particular, Webster's study underlined that the themes and the costumes worn by actors were similar. But most scholars were unconvinced about the validity of the link made between Attic comedy and comic vases until Oliver Taplin published Comic Angels in 1993. This book showed how certain South Italian vases could even be linked with old comedy Therefore, with plays composed several decades before this vase, these vases were made. Since the 90s, theatre historians and specialists of the theatre-related iconography, first and foremost Richard Green, have used the visual evidence to shed light on ancient performances, whereas other scholars have been keen to highlight the independence and the autonomy of the comic iconography from the dramatic texts and stage. Um, a few vases from South Italy are clearly influenced by scenes from comedies, first produced in Athens in the 5th and the 4th centuries, as performed in Magna Graecia, possibly with a few adaptations. For example, Eric Sapo and Oliver Taplin have identified on this Apulian Bell crater, attributed to the Schiller painter, the scene from Aristophanes' Thesmophoria Zusai, where Euripides' relative, disguised as a woman to take part in the Thesmophoria, is uncovered and then threatens to kill the supposed baby of one of the attendants. This other bell crater, produced in Pestum and attributed to Astias, most probably refers to Eupolis Demis, an Athenian comedy from the 5th century. A part of the comic verses probably reflect performances of local comedies that cannot be distinguished from Attic comedies, since middle comedy should rather be considered Greek or Panhellenic, as underlined in particular by Eric Sapo. Of course, these paintings neither illustrate comic texts, nor are they faithful testimonies to the performances that inspired them. How then do we square the testimonies of texts and images that require different modes of perception owing to their nature, functions, and respective recipients. A potential route forward consists in seizing the subtle reflective echoes between texts and images, shedding light on the ways in which they correspond. Today, I'll take a few examples of these echoes in dealing with the body in movement to show the extent to which bringing together texts and images we can try to reconstruct the material aspects of ancient performances, but also, um, but also better understand the poetic and dramatic functions of costumes, gestures, and the words that comment on them. To do this, I took at three particular aspects of the comic. I, sorry, I look at three particular aspects of the comic body movement. Three kinds of motion. First, I'll focus on costume. In particular, I'll address the plasticity of the mask. Then, we'll look at comic acting and gestures to underline the expressivity of the comic body. Finally, we'll look at the imaginary body 
and how it is characterized by constant motion. Of course, I'll be happy to talk other aspects of the comic body or the links between text and iconography during the discussion time, if you wish. So first, the plasticity of the comic mask. I would like to start with the, movement, the movements of the mask, focusing on the plasticity conferred by comic ugliness and words, as plasticity has appeared to me as an essential feature of the comic body. As you know, Aristotle describes the comic mask as ugly and distorted, iscon tikai destraminon. To clarify the nature of this comic ugliness, let's look at an Apulian bell crater dating from the start of the fourth century. It's the only vase to bring together on the same stage a tragic character and comic characters. An inscription, uh, which is not really visible, but here, an inscription identifies the tragic character as Aegistus. Two of the comic characters are labelled Corregos. You can see it here and here. Um, the one on the left with white hair is looking towards Aegistus. The one on the right with black hair is paying attention to the speech made by a character labelled Purius. Following Oliver Taplin's interpretation of the scene, this vast painting refers to a comedy featuring two citizens performing Corrigi. The oldest might support the serious genre of tragedy, as represented by Aegistus, while the other might support comedy incarnated by Purius, Purius being a typical comic slave name. Many elements lead us to think that this verse refers to an Attic comedy that the painter and customer both knew. In the first place, the Attic spelling Corregos instead of Corragos, as it would have been in the Doric dialect spoken in Terras, where the vase was, was made. <coughs> there are also the metatheatrical character of the scene, with the reference to the Corregi, the opposition between the dramatic genres, and the opposition between the two age groups. The contrast between the features of Aegistus and those of the comic characters offers a clearer understanding of the nature of the comic distortion. The features of the tragic character are fine and comparatively unexpressive. His eyes are well proportioned, his nose straight, his skin is smooth and lightly marked with wrinkles in the middle of his brow. These are characteristics of the good man, according to physiognomonics. To use a term common in that treatise, Aegistus' face is symmetrous, well proportioned and regular. By contrast, one is struck by the plastic aspect of the comic masks. The foreheads are often long and curved, and the eyes sunken or bulging. bulging. Noses are often trumpet-shaped or snub. The eyebrow lines are very pronounced. The eyebrow lines of the old Corregos are seated very low and seem to join together. Those of Pierias plunge from his temples down towards his nose, and those of the young Corregos are very arched. Like Pierias, many comic characters have flabby skin and wrinkles marked on their cheeks, even if they are not necessarily old. Finally, the three comic characters have got small round eyes and big mouths. Let me let apart uh, the meaning of comic ugliness, which bespeaks the baseness of the character, to focus on the poetic virtues of the plasticity of the mask. While Aristotle employs the perfect diastraminon to describe the concrete and stable appearance of the mask, considered as an object, the visual evidence, by contrast, gives the impression that each element in this ensemble made of hollows and lumps, destabilizes the form and unity of the face in a dynamic tension. This disintegration lends the mark a plasticity and hence a basic lack of definition, proper to the incompleteness, sorry, in the incompleteness, I will not <laughs> succeed in pronouncing this word, of the grotesque body, not finite and subject to an ending transformation just as Bakhtin described it. The qualities of the comic mask depend upon the character's poor characterization in old comedy, 
as well as its capacity to metamorphose. They have been linked by David Wise and Angeliki Varakis to the recreative quality of the Aristophanic character, as Michael Silk describes it. The mask is thus redefined in line with the stage context, with the acting, and in accordance with the images the text suggests to the audience. This process has been highlighted by David Wise and Peter Meineck in different ways, especially for tragedy and new comedy masks. I will take two uh, striking examples example of this resemanticization of the comic mask due to its specific ugliness. This Apulian vase from around 380-370 provides uh, a remarkable example of the animation of the comic mask. An old man, whose name Karen is given by an inscription, is climbing a flight of steps with difficulty. Two slaves are trying to help him. The first, Xantias, is pulling him upwards. The second has his knees bent and his hands and head placed against his master's backside. The slave and the master seem to be one and the same, namely a centaur with badly distorted features. The name of the old man, Chiron, and the anonymity of his servant leads the spectator to interpret the association of the two interlocked bodies as being the body of a centaur. This superimposition is not exclusively linked to the arrangement of the bodies and the suggestive power of the name Chiron. It's also most motivated by the monstrous and indefinable features of the old man that, through being labile, open up a channel for the imagination. The gap between the suggested image of the centaur and the real elements confers an unfinished character on the metamorphosis of the old man and his slave, as if it came before our eyes. The dynamic gulp resolves itself is in the unassailable features of the mask. The designation of some of the ugliest faces on the Aristophanic stage, such as those of the old women in Ecclesia Zuzai, is evidence of the same process. At the end of the play, three old women seek to enjoy their new sexual prerogative with the young man whom they terrorize. The first to appear on stage, the first old woman to appear on stage, is likely wearing the mask of an ordinary old woman, ugly like all comic masks, but excessively made up with white lead and scarlet. The second is described as a bloody monster, some kind of empusa covered with one big blood blister, Empusatis ex aimatus frictinan amphiasmene. As you know, empusa is a hellish ghost that can take on any shape. The third old woman is described as a monkey smothered in white lead or an old dark arisen from the underworld. And then at line 1101 as a frunen a frine or toad with a lecutus on her cheek. The polysemy of the line stresses the ability of the face. Frine is a common name for a hetera. The character is associated with a prostitute owing to her excessive makeup, her crocodus and her obscene behavior. However, the term frine also means toad. The lecutus is an elongated vase for holding perfumed oil, while grounded uh, lecutoi are mentioned at several points in this scene when the young man compares the old women to corpses. These verses were used in a funerary context. The thick layer of white lead that the old woman has used to whiten her face are the reasons behind the mention of the lecutus. Nevertheless, the picture remains obscure and several interpretations have been offered. Whatever the case, the polysemy of line 1101, which designates the third woman as a hetaira or toad with a locutus on her face, the fluidity of meaning here reflects the instability of comic features, as well as the fundamental polysemy of the mask, <coughs> the glittering language of the playwright preventing any definitive fixing of the corresponding image. Now, let's move on from costume and see how the analysis of text and images can provide a better picture of the comic gestures. As an example, I'll focus on the expressivity of the comic body. 
As you know, the feelings of characters in Aristophanes are very often manifested by physical reactions that they are unable to suppress. The paradox in peace is illustrating of this when the chorus, crazy with joy, cannot prevent their legs from dancing, despite repeated requests from Trigis. The chorotai themselves highlight that their bodies are out of control. Al egog uskematit zain bulom, al huf hedones ukemukinontos ototoskelei koroeten. I don't actually want to dance. It's just that from sheer delight, my legs are dancing by themselves without my moving them. The gestures of the actors depicted on the vases also convey the strong emotions of the characters, without them seeming able to moderate these untimely manifestations. For example, on this apulent cutter, which shows Heracles eating the gifts offered to Zeus, the characters' gestures are very much demonstrative. Heracles is ostensibly enjoying the cake that he brings to his mouth, his head thrown back, as if to mock Zeus, who rages on high on his throne. The god is in fact brandishing his lightning rod and vainly orders Heracles to stop. His indignation is revealed by the agitation of his legs. Richard Green has stressed how the postures and positions of characters on comic verses in relation to one another inform us about their power relations. This crater, depicting an old man returning from a trip, only to find his servant and wife busy with the household, a const, is a good example of this. The master is positioned at the left of the stage and is bent over his stick, appearing downcast. The slave, on the other hand, stands in the center, addressing him as if giving him a lesson. During the master's absence, the hierarchical relations have been appended with the complicity of the spouse. This Lucanian calyx crater confirms that the expressiveness of the bodies depicted on comic verses not only depend on the visual nature of the testimony. It provides interesting evidence for the study of comic body language and the interplay between gesture and speech in comic performances. On this bell crater, dated to about 400 BC, we see two actors playing naked men. One of them is holding a stick and is threatening an old man who is, playing naked, uh, who is standing on tiptoes, his hands together above his head. On a platform in front of a decorated door, an actor disguised as an old woman addresses them with vehemence. At his feet lies a dead goose next to a basket from which the heads of two kids stick out. It's a challenge to understand this scene in particular, the enigmatic stance of the old man in the middle. The three actors' utterances are revealed by inscriptions. These excerpts of dialogue are in the Attic dialect, suggesting that the comedy referred to could be Athenian in origin. The old woman is saying, Ego parexo. Yeah, in this sense, Ego parexo, um, which uh, means. Uh, I shall hand over, probably the old man, to the law. He is likely responsible for the death of the goose. He says, he or she has bound my hands above me. Catedes, in that sense, catedes ano to care. The young man's words, nora reteblo, are at first incomprehensible. Nora reteblo in this sense. The inscriptions are puzzling for the modern viewer, particularly because the old man's hands are not tied with any rope. This has given rise to several hypotheses. The young man is probably one of the Scythian archers who served as a policeman in classical Athens. What he says would therefore seem to be a comic imitation or transcription of the Circassian dialect, a Scythian language. Marshall hypothesis that the archer had hung the old man up by his wrists to interrogate him. The actor is therefore feigning his hands being tied since such a staging would not have been possible under performance conditions. It has also been conjectured that the old man has been bewitched. The human would thus have uttered a magic spell 
causing the old man to assume this strange position. Whatever the truth is, uh, the difficulty we have in reconstructing the intrigue shows that this painting refers to a precise moment in a comedy that the buyer of the vase knew sufficiently well to appreciate in collusion with the painter. Incidentally, above the scene, there is a male mask that, according to a shared convention in Italian iconography, evokes another character in the play. And, perched at the top of a slope, a young man, La Belle Tragoidos, seems to be watching the spectacle. He might be a tragic actor or the satirical personification of tragedy, as suggested by Oliver. Although the comic character's words are inscribed in the image, and the theatrical reference of this scene was obviously known by the owner of the vase, the actor's gestures are represented in a very expressive way. The old woman's outstretched arm and open hand express her anger towards the old man, whom she threatens to drag before the law court. The young man's pose, with his hip slightly jutting, his left hand at his waist and his torso leaning backwards, displays his feeling of superiority towards the old man, whom he is threatening or bewitching quite incomprehensibly. The old man's fear is revealed by the effort he is making to turn around and keep an eye on his warder, even though his hands are tied up in the air. Let's now look more closely as, uh, at how the character's speeches are integrated into the picture and how verbal signs of dramatic representation are translated into the visual semantics of the vase. Moreover, let's assess what the placement of words into the images teaches about the functions of speech in relation to gesture. First, we can note that the writing accompanies the gestures um, it highlights, or otherwise materializes their development. The retrograde inscription springing from the old woman's lips is inscribed in a line that is more or less parallel to her arm. Thus, the inscription somehow extends the movement. The line of writing which gives us the archer's words is placed on the same level as his mouth. It's parallel to the stick, thus reinforcing the threat. The retrograde inscription relating to what the old man says begins quite significantly on the same level as his eyes, not his mouth. It makes, a descend, it makes a descending and irregularly oblique line, thus materializing the shaky look of fear that the thief directs towards the archer's stick. It also emphasizes the twisting movement he makes to check on what is happening behind his back. It is thus the body, whose movements are then ultimately highlighted and relayed through speech, that is revelatory of speaking, of feeling, sorry. Such is the case in the prologue of Lysistrata. <coughs> After an extended period of suspense, Lysistrata finally explained her strategy for restoring peace to Greece. Women must abstain from all sexual relations with their husbands. Lysistrata then describes the silent re reaction of her female companions, a reaction that the audience can observe with their own eyes. Timoi metras trefeste, poi badzidzete. Why are you turning your backs on me? Where, where are you going? Otai, timoi muete, kananuete. I ask you, why are you pursing your lips and tossing your heads? Tikros te traptai, tidakron katai betai. Why pales your color? Why is this flow of tears? Poeset eu poeset. Etimelete. Will you do it or will you not? Or why do you hesitate? Who can poesaim? Al o polemos apeto. I won't do it. Let the war carry on. The spectacle of these physical reactions, relayed verbally in a quasi tragic tone by Lysistrata, translates in a concrete manner the refusal of female bodies to deprive themselves of their male uh, counterparts. Only then do come words. Do words come. The eloquence of the body is highlighted by the ambivalence of the verb metastrophane, which means both a change in attitude and spirit, and by the gesture of refusal designated by the verb ananoein. There's a shift here in what Lizzie Strata says between the description of movements that are actually made on stage and the description of physical signs of pain, tears, and a change of color, 
which the spectators are invited to imagine. Surreptitiously, speech takes over from the obsess to reveal what the contexts and conditions of performance were not able to do. <coughs> Poe notes that the gestures revealing characters' feeling are often underlined by words in passages with a falsely tragic tone, such as the lines of Lysistrata upon which we've just commented. In Frogs, while Euripides is condemning a skillless technique of staging silent characters in order to increase the interest of the audience, Aeschylus' gestures of annoyance are highlighted verbally by Dionysus. What are you fidgeting and fretting like that? This remarkable mention of a movement in the text exemplifies how Aristophanes' comedy incorporates tragic devices in a burlesque manner. Here, describing the gesture aims to highlight Aeschylus' silence, which is li like that of his characters, and, by contrast, the comic intemperance of the poet who, far from remaining calm and dignified, gets agitated exclaiming and grinding his teeth before exploding. Let's return to the vase with Kieran to take a closer look at the expressiveness of comic gesture in a paratragic context. The eloquence of the gestures, which overplay the effort, render any words superfluous. This excess cancels out the pathetic aspect of the scene, providing the source of its humor. The tragic image of Kieran the Centaur, wounded and suffering, is immediately misappropriated. Even if it is impossible to affirm that this painting generally refers to the performance of a comedy, or that even faithfully reflects it, we are amazed by the identity of the comic procedures employed here to those of Aristophanes, especially when he parodies, parodies the pathetic stagings of Euripides. For example, at the end of Acarnians, the braggart general Lamachus returns from battle limping. The messenger who announces his arrival explains in a tragic tone the terrible accident, accident that befell him. The man's been wounded by a stake in jumping over a trench and wrenched his ankle backwards and put it out of joint, and broken his head falling on a stone and woken up the Gorgon from her sleep on his chin. We get the impression that during this ridiculous accident, the character's ankle was completely dislocated. Lamachus then appears, supported by two soldiers, announcing his pain in pathetic tones, while Dicaiopolis, eating and surrounded by two prostitutes, evinces well-being. The final scene of Acarnians is thus presented as a diptych, showing in a caricatural manner the suffering body of the tragic alongside the joyful body of the comic. More specifically, Aristophanes seems to parody the suffering bodies of Euripides' heroes, whom Dicaiopolis describes as limping when he visits Euripides. Lamachus' lament, demanding his companions to support his, leg, his legs, calls to mind, for example, <coughs> Line 198 to 100 of Euripides Hippolytus, as spoken by Phaedra. Raise up my body, hold my head erect, my limbs are unstruck, take my fair arms, servants. The pathetic pattern is exploited in two ways in this uh, final cell or scene of occurrence. Lamachus provides a caricatural image, while Dicaiopolis presents the reverse image. Uh, so you can uh, see here, la beste mou, la beste mou, la beste tu skelus papa i post la beste ophiloi, la macus take hold, take hold of my leg, aha, take hold, dear friends, dikaiopolis, emu de ges fo tu peus amphome sou post la beste ophiloi, and you both grip my cock midway, take hold, dear girls. This few analyses illustrate, I hope, close correspondences and more subtle echoes between comic vases and Aristophanes comedies and then the benefits of bringing them together for the study of comic gestures. Comparing texts and images reveals the visual effectiveness and essential function of gesture in Aristophanes dramaturgy, particularly in the paratragic context, in contradiction to what the abundance of gestures performed on the comic stage might lead one to expect. 
Of course, the major role played by body language is linked to the remarkable expressiveness of the bodies evoked and staged in all and middle comedy. The final part of this talk, for the final part of this talk, I'd like to examine another essential feature of the comic body as it is staged or imagined, its constant motion until the dawn of new comedy. In Aristophanes, in the comic fragments uh, that describes or stage the most ridiculous characters in middle comedy, as well as on comic vases, movement appears to be a fundamental characteristic of the comic body. It is in motion in two respects. On the one hand, the comic body exhibits frantic activity, while on the other, it's open to endless word definition thanks to the imaging referring to it. I've already discussed the latter aspect when examining mask. The demonstration could be extended to padding, but in the time available, I prefer to focus on the perpetual movement of the body. There's no need to stress the unbridled activity of Aristophanic characters. These figures run around the stage in all directions, making all kinds of gestures. The generic nature of this activity, which distinguishes the comic stage from the tragic stage, has been widely emphasized. We might think it less likely to find characters driven by such vitality on the very brink of the new comedy, except for slaves. However, comic vases from the 360s onwards display many solitary figures walking on or running as if that would be typical of a comic character. Here are a few examples. This Apulian Oinokoe shows a slave who's just committed a theft running with lightness in spite of his cumbersome padding. On this Apulian bell crater, a man dressed in a simple exomis hurries along with his head sunken between his shoulders, a typical posture of comic characters. His appearance contrasts with the stillness of the Hermic pillar on the other side of the vase. Two other vases from the middle of the 4th century exhibits a similar play between the two faces of the vases. On this Apulian Ascos, an old man is chasing his servant in order to beat him. The master is represented alone, brandishing his stick on one face of the vase. You have to revolve the vase in order to see the slave here, the slave running with great strides. The ground lines of dots and the floral motifs framing the two images reveal that, rather than actors interpreting roles, these images show comic characters who seem to have acquired in the collective imagination an existence independent of dramatic representation. On one of the faces of this calyx crater, we see an old man running. He is dressed in a wild hematian from which cakes and fruits tumble out. Turning the vase, we discover that he is heading over to a tall, beautiful woman who seems to be expecting him. On both vases, the gaps separating the images recreate the time span of the run. By wrapping the representation of the scene around the vase, the painter draw the eye into a circular movement, giving the character's chase a sense of endlessness. The inex inexhaustible vitality of the comic body is also evident in Dionysiac scenes, for instance on this Ascos from Ruvo, on which the comic actor or character joins in Dionysius Thiazos dancing in the God's Honor. Comic fragments from the second half of the fourth century also give the impression that the most ridiculous characters are ceaselessly active. Several fragments speak of the parasite's hurry in getting to banquets, to which he has not even been invited, as in this line from Alexis Fugitive. I just uh, read the translation. Carefan is always coming up, coming up with some new trick and getting his dinners without contributing any money. For the minute the sun comes up, he goes and stands in the place where the cooks rent their earthenware. If he sees something being rented for a feast, he asks the cook who the host is, and if he finds the door open, he's the first one in. <coughs> the franticness of Carefan the Parasite 
who is aroused as soon as the sun rises to be the first to enter the house where a banquet will be held that evening, is a reminder of the trickery and energy deployed around the clock <coughs> by Theocleon to arrive at court at the beginning of wasps. The parasites show the same haste in Antiphanus or Aristophan. The continual activity and omnipresence of the parasite gives the impression that he is untiring. This is how the parasite Titumalus is mocked in Alexis Olympias. Uh, your husband's poor, my dear, and they say that the only kind of man death fears. Titumalus, at any rate, is walking around immortal. The fabulous immortality of the character lies as much in his capacity to endure hunger as in his hyperactivity. This ambivalent figure is in many respects phantasmagorical. He is immortal, although starving hungry. The comic poets, similarly, often mock the philosophical practice of walking around to promote deep thought. It's likely that actors embodying thinkers from the academy paced around the length and breadth of the stage, as does the female character in Alexis Meropis, comparing herself to Plato. Uh, you've come just in time since I'm in a tizzy. Just pacing up and down like Plato, Anokato te paripatus osper Platon, I haven't come up with anything except Sir Lex. The Pythagoreans are also described as always working. See how they are depicted in this fragment uh, by Aristophan. As for going hungry and eating nothing, consider yourself to be looking at Titumalos or Philippides. When it comes to drinking water, I'm a frog. When it comes to enjoying bulbs and vegetables, a caterpillar. As regards not bathing, dirt. As for spending the winter in the open air, a blackbird. For putting up with tiffling heat and talking at midday, a cicada. For not using olive oil or even giving it a glance, a dust cloud. For walking around without shoes just before dawn, a crane. For not even sleeping a little, a bat. The philosopher here, as elsewhere, is comparable with the parasite. This fragment features in the part of um, the hypnosophist dedicated to parasites. The images used to demonstrate both the weak constitution and the endurance of the Pythagorean are mostly borrowed from the animal kingdom. Thanks to their rapid accumulation, these evocations confer on the identity and body of the character a moving, multiplied aspect, indeed one of great poetry, thereby alleviating the negativity of the tara, satara. So I, I could have uh, shown the same with the etaira, uh, but I've already talked too long, so I will uh, stop here. Um, iconographic and textual evidence thus shows, show that the bodies of the most ridiculous characters in middle comedy continue to be endowed with a dynamism and vitality like those of the characters in old comedy. These features are revealed as much in the actors playing as in the virtuoso descriptions that other characters give of these comic types. Words breath a universal uh, vitality into the comic puppet, affording it a protean and poetic body in constant movement. Thank you very much for your attention.